Local productions seen on Delta College Public Media are made possible with support from viewers like you. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Junior Doan's The Spark. I'm Junior Doan. Thank you for joining us. Today, I will be speaking with Chef Evan Sumrall, co-owner of Astra, the newly opened farm-to-table restaurant in downtown Midland, Michigan. Oh, I'm so glad you're here, Evan. That's just really wonderful. But a lot of people don't know what Astor is. Tell us about it. So, Astor, it came, uh, well, I've been visiting Midland for a while. My wife's from here and we, um, we just really enjoy the farm to table movement. I think it's super important, uh, to support local farms and, uh, something I felt like was kind of missing in Midland that we wanted to accomplish. And so Aster came about, um, Aster is a wildflower that, uh, grows in different parts in Michigan. Uh, most likely off on the side of the road. Uh, you drive by it every day. You probably don't even know it. And uh, Aster is actually our son's birth flower. So that's also where the name comes from too. And the idea of it is to, we evolve and change throughout the seasons. Um, so we're pretty hyper seasonal. Uh, we change the menu very often. Uh, and the, um, the farms we use are super local. Uh, most of them are no more than uh, 200 miles away from us. All of them are in Michigan. Um, and so that's kind of how it started. Uh, I've been cooking my whole life and this is kind of something that I've- So uh, you been... actually eat them? What's that? The asters? The what? The flower. Can you eat them? You can't eat the flower, unfortunately. No, asters are not edible. It would be sweet if they were, though. Are there flowers you can eat? There are flowers you can't eat. There's actually a lot in Michigan. Uh, a lot of foraging mushrooms, as well as uh, different types of herbs you can find on the, side of the, on the side of the ground. I mean, honestly, lamb's quarter grows pretty rapidly out here. Um, there's sorrel too, um, which is very small. It kind of looks like a, um, like a lucky clover is on the ground, you know, like a four leaf clover. Uh, and so that's something that, you know, hopefully we'll be able to accomplish during the spring and summer. Uh, but it makes it a little bit more difficult during the winter time when everything's frosted over. So you talk about being a farm to table restaurant. This is a very new trend of the last few years, but could you explain it for those who might not have run across it yet? So I wouldn't necessarily call it a trend. I think that it's something that we should do in ourselves uh, to be, you know, um, seas eating seasonal is also being sustainable. Um, that's a huge part of what Aster is, is the sustainability of what we're doing. Um, you don't want to eat things out of season uh, because it's not things from that are around. Uh, if someone's eating a tomato in the Midwest in the middle of uh, the winter, you're getting it from California, uh, which is not a problem, but I just think this it's important to support local. So you want to eat locally and that's going to be what can be grown locally. So for us, farm to table means um, that is based off of sustainability. So whatever the farms have right now is what we're going to be selling and what's going to be on the menu. So essentially when those things run out or get sold out, the menu changes. Um, we have only been open for four weeks right now uh, with takeout only. And I'm already changing two menu items this week uh, because they're, the farmers don't have what I need anymore. And so I need to change the menu. So for us, Farm and Table is in that realm of it's not just about um, sustainability, but it's about hyper seasonality. So you're eating what the farms have and you're cooking different things that they have. And at some point they're going to either sell out or they're going to run out. Um, and so that's when we change the menu. When you were looking around for purveyors, were there many to choose from? There was. Uh, one thing for us is we want everything to be um, organic. So we are looking specifically for organic uh, grass-fed beef, organic chickens. We're looking for organic produce. 
Uh, one of the farms we work very closely with is Goodstead Farm. Uh, the farmer, her, the owner, her name is Sarah, uh, and she is incredible. It's off of uh, M30 and Hope, um, which is literally 17 miles away from us. Uh, she actually comes tomorrow to deliver my produce every week, and it's all organic. Um, our beef and chicken comes from Bay's Family Farms, which is in, I'm sorry if I'm pronouncing this wrong, but it's either Elsie or Elsie, Michigan. Elsie, it's about an hour away from here. Um, and we just started working with them and we're super excited uh, to be getting things. Everything from them is organic as well. Their chickens are organic free range and their beef is organic grass fed. Um, you can't get much better than this. And a big thing for us is we want to try to make this affordable for people to have. Anyone can come in and eat this. It's an affordable meal for everybody. Do they bring the product to you or do you have to go out to them? Luckily, the farmers actually deliver most of my products to me. During the summer, I really enjoy going to the farmer's market. And I loved it this year. And this is how pretty much I met most of our farmers is through the farmer's market. Just talking with them seeing what their culture is, what they believe in, how they're farming. I've visited multiple farms, enjoyed a lot, and, and met a lot of great people and made really great relationships pretty quickly because we share the same um, sensibility to what we're doing. And we think it's super important with this type of movement um, that it's not, it should be a trend because trends go away. This isn't a trend that should be forever. How do you project what you're going to need since yours is uh, not many, perhaps at this point, um, future reservations? Well, um, that's a good question. <laughs> uh, it's, it changes every week, so it, it varies um, of what we need to order or what we think that we're uh, projecting that we're going to do. And, you know, luckily I have a, a system that tells me certain menu items that I'm selling more than others uh, and how much I'm going through on a weekly basis. For me, uh, to keep up with that, you just kind of look at how people are eating. And, you know, obviously we have a burger on the menu and it's our number one seller. I mean, how can you not like a burger? And it's delicious. Um, and so we kind of just see that and understand that, uh, you know, we kind of kind of try to go off that the best we can. And what is your role? Because I understand you work with your wife. Absolutely. So my role, I'm the chef and owner. Um, not only do I own it as well as my wife, but I also am the chef. So I create the menu. Um, I make sure things are running properly. I mean, I'm the dishwasher. I'm the whatever it needs to be done. I'm doing it, you know. Um, at the moment, it's just me and my wife. Uh, I'm in the back cooking. And she's pretty much putting, making sure everything is going to the right people who are getting takeout and then the to-go boxes and the right bags. Um, so it's a, it's, it's definitely an awesome uh, feeling to have to be with your family. And uh, a funny thing is, is we live above the restaurant. So we never, I'm never away from it uh, more than a few hours. I can tell you that. Um, but it's, it's a rewarding thing right now. I, and I'm, I'm excited for when we open back up and I can get all my employees back and we can continue to move on and do some really fun things here. And tell us about your training. Uh, well, that's funny that you asked that. Uh, so when I've been cooking since I was nine years old, uh, I, when I could sit over the counter, I wanted to cook food. I always wanted to help my mom. And, uh, you know, believe it or not, I, I played hockey for a long time in my life. And, uh, you know, I wanted, I wanted to go to college with hockey uh, and, and get it to pay for it. But, you know, my mom always told me I have backup plans. And obviously, I'm, a, I'm not a very big guy. So that didn't work out. And cooking was my next idea that I wanted to do. Um, so I went to the Art Institute of Atlanta. Um, I graduated with my bachelor's in culinary business management. And I pretty much packed up all my stuff and, uh, you know, towed my car behind a U-Haul and drove up to Chicago and wanted to work at a Michelin star restaurant. That was the goal. And I slept on my buddy's couch for about a month and I finally got a job at Acadia and I spent my next five years working there. Um, they had one Michelin star when I started and then eventually we got two Michelin stars. Um, and it was an experience I will never forget. Um, it taught me a lot about discipline, self-motivation, organization, um, so many things that are involved with being a chef. Um, and it was hard and tough, but it made me better uh, as a cook 
and a chef. I, I don't really call myself a chef. I'm, I'm a cook. I like to cook food. Uh, so that's a huge thing for me. Um, and that's kind of where my experience came from. I then started working and, um, you know, I met my wife, our son was born and then I started working my way up the ladder, became a sous chef. Uh, and then I started running restaurants. I ran a bar for a little bit. And then I finally had an opportunity to run a farm to table restaurant. And that's really on my realm of what I really enjoy to do. And, um, so I did that for a few years and then, uh, went on to another farm and table restaurant, super hyper seasonal as well. Um, and, uh, enjoyed my time there as, as well. And then, uh, you know, the pandemic happened. It seems like physically exhausting work <laughs> to be in a kitchen, preparing food to a, a very high level. Uh, what did you have to learn about posture or uh, duration or standing on your feet that helps you through this? Uh, um, well, caffeine uh, definitely helps. Uh, but honestly, when you have done it for this long and you've worked the amount of hours, uh, you know, you're kind of used to it. Um, you know, I've been doing this for, I was, uh, my first ever job, I was a dishwasher at a Jersey Mike's sub shop. I don't know if you've had Jersey Mike's before, but it's delicious. I like it. Uh, but that was my first ever job. I was 14. Um, and I knew this is what I wanted to do. Um, and I started, you know, working to do it. And I feel like when you're passionate about something and you don't, um, you don't look at it as like hours or time spent. You look at it as a, it's a learning experience and it's something that you enjoy. Um, and I think that's to me, like I get a chance to, I don't go to work every day. I get to go have fun and cook food. I, I want to have fun. That's the, that's the plan. You speak of joy, but what are the satisfactions for you of being in a professional kitchen? Well, I mean, owning one right now is pretty satisfying to be able to build this with your family and, uh, and really see something that you've envisioned and created was very satisfying. Um, it was tough as well, but now when I look at it, I'm, I'm very happy with what we created. It's pretty exceptional. Um, but honestly, to the satisfactions of being in a kitchen are very small. Um, you know, teaching my cooks how to cut something properly, uh, teaching them how to make a stock properly, and teaching them to create soups, sauces, how to think about um, going about making a dish, the conceptualization of it, um, getting them to open up their minds. It's just those small satisfactions are more, more to me. Do kitchens have personalities based on the head chef? Oh yeah, it's based off their culture, what they, you know, what they want to bring. I mean, there's a lot of kitchens that are very serious, um, that um, are, are tough to work in and tough to work for those chefs. But there's also, there's also kitchens that aren't so tough and they're a little more laid back, but the food may not be as laid back. For me, I wanted to have a balance of both worlds. I really enjoy the upper echelon of cooking food but I don't necessarily like the cultures of the kitchens because they're very tough. Um, for me, I wanted just to create a kitchen that was just about love and respect and everyone was just here to learn, even myself. I don't know everything. And I want my cooks to understand that too, that I'm gonna be the first person to say that I don't know how to do that. Or if they know something, I want, to, I want them to teach me. Um, and to be open on that level, I think is uh, something that I, you know, always thought about i think chefs put too much pressure on themselves of thinking they need to know everything when they don't we're all in this together you just got to learn i read kitchen confidential several years ago and that brought into my awareness how hard it is or as you say is you enjoy it to to be part of a team like that and it's much dependent on um i guess the personality or the style of the leader. I think yours is more collaborative than certainly his was. Of course, there's, you know, there's kitchens like that that I worked in. I worked for very serious chefs um, that would not be fun. You know, uh, it wasn't fun to work in. Um, I didn't get into cooking for uh, policies and procedures. You know, this is not a nine to five. This is not sitting in a cubicle, punching numbers or on a computer. Um, there is a lot of egos and creativity that's involved with that. 
Um, your leader should have that creativity and that leadership on themselves to create the atmosphere that they want to be in. Because you got to understand when you're working in these kitchens, you're there more than you're with those people more than you are with your own family. So you have to get along and you have to create a culture that people want to be there. Um, and yeah, it's kitchen confidential showed a lot of, uh, mistreatment and, uh, abuse and, you know, drug, you know, usage, all those things. Um, but I think the most important thing that comes out of it is that honestly, it's just a one big family in a kitchen and it's not, you know, um, I think that's, that has been used very loosely, um, these days, but it's, you spend so much time with them. You would want them to be around you uh, and to have a positive environment to be in because positivity is going to make you strive. Um, I understand certain aspects of it where, you know, people work better under pressure, um, myself included. I enjoy doing things. We call it on the fly, meaning that you are just creating something out of nothing right then and there for a special guest or whatever it may be. Um, you know, there's many different names for it that people have. Uh, and I think that's, that's fun to me. Um, and that's pressure that I feel for myself to do things like that. Now, I don't want to create a culture for myself where people don't feel inspired to want to be better. I don't, you know, I want to create chefs. I don't want to create uh, cooks or people that are just in this industry to get by. I don't, I want to, I, I, we should celebrate this. This is a very uh, wonderful thing for us. What were some of the family values you grew up with? Was yours a cooking family? <laughs> uh, mine was not at all, which is very weird. Uh, my parents are like, why do you cook food? I don't know. I don't know. I don't know why I do. I just really enjoy it. Um, and it's something that's creative for me and, and all those natures. But um, we, we did sit down and have dinner every Sunday night together. Uh, and I thought that was just always a special time for me. Um, cause I cooked a lot of those dinners and I enjoyed sitting down and eating and just being with my family. And I think that's something that's important for here at Asker is that, you know, we don't have TVs or there's no distractions in the restaurant. Um, it's very simple. And the idea of that is to live in the moment and be with your family and your company that you're with and enjoy a really great meal and a great conversation. And hopefully soon a really nice glass of wine too. You know, it's such a, uh, an unusual time we're living through the Wuhan COVID-19 virus. I think you're quite brave to open in the middle of it as if it's <laughs> nothing unusual. How do you compensate? We do take out. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's pretty much our compensation at the moment. Um, you know, we... We, pre we did a friends and family on Saturday. The governor came through on Sunday and said that that Wednesday we were going to close indoor dining. Well, Tuesday before, obviously that Wednesday, we were gonna open to the public. And we sat down and had a meeting and really talked about, you know, the causes and effects of this um, and what's the most important decision. And for us, it's safety. We wanna keep our, our customers obviously safe, but our employees safe. And, um, and that was a huge thing for us. And it was a huge, hard decision to make that we had to just do takeout right now. And so we feel that it's comfortable to open back up. Um, and to open this place during the pandemic, honestly, I didn't even think about it. I thought, you know, it took us five months to open this. I didn't know what was going to happen in five months. Things change so quickly nowadays. Um, and it's, you know, we just roll with the punches. We evolve as a restaurant and an industry we've had, we've had to evolve uh, into what we need to do to survive. I mean, look in New York there, you can't do indoor dining, but you can build a structure outside of your restaurant and have pretty much indoor outdoor dining. It makes no sense what's going on right now um, in any aspect of this, but we, we adapt and we have had to forever. Um, and so I think that's part of it. It's just, you know, COVID happened and, and uh, I lost my job and we had, uh, we were waiting to see what happened. And, you know, me and my wife are not people who want to wait on things. Um, I like to go take them. If I want something, I'm going to go get it. And this just happened to fall on our lap. And it was something that we have always wanted to do. Um, and it was just, uh, we felt like it was time and it was time to leave Chicago um, and move on. 
and try to create something for ourselves. And, you know, we can control this, you know, uh, which makes me feel more comfortable in that realm, to be honest with you, instead of working for someone that controls it for me. When you when anyone starts up a restaurant, don't you have to, in essence, pay attention to the budget and have a kitty, have a uh, certain amount of money to supposedly or glide you over? The first is it year, six months, three years? How how were you thinking about the financing <laughs> side of it? Uh, well, the financial side of it, I was just thinking, let's just get open first. <laughs> <laughs> We, uh, we pretty much spent all of our money to open. Um, and then when the setbacks, I mean, we were a month late to open, uh, which is going to happen. I mean, we, things, things happen, waiting on licensings, uh, you know, all sorts of things. Um, and, uh, you know, so we, we were trying to be as careful as possible. And, you know, I'm a little bit of a, a numbers nerd and enjoy looking at the that side of the business too um because honestly let's to be honest you, you can't cook you can cook the best food in the world but if you can't if your numbers are not right you're gonna fail um and that's an important part of this you know did we stay in our budget no did we open when i wanted to no <laughs> um <laughs> Did things open and we were able to have guests inside? Yes, for a day. And it was nice. Um, and, you know, but we we needed to open and we needed to make sure that, you know, all the things that did happen that we could pay for, we did pay for. And now, you know, that we're at this point, it's uh, we're we're getting there, you know, um, but it, it's going to take time to get back to what we what we had to start. Um, and that's OK. This is part of it. And we evolved from it, right? Right. For all of us. I mean, who expected yeah. this at all? And who expected uh, it? are you in a month to month lease or, or do you have several years that would be a burden? No, I have, I have four years, uh, four year lease, but um, we are, we, we want to own it. I mean, we're not going anywhere. We we're here to stay. Um, and obviously Aster is not the end all be all. I know this is like way into the future, but we want to have more things. You know, I, downtown Midland is pretty incredible and it's changing and I want to help that change. Um, you know, a great butcher shop would be nice, a nice bakery in downtown. Um, there's a lot of great things, uh, that we have thought about, you know, but that's obviously further down the line. Uh, but we are here for the long haul. I mean, we're not, we're not planning on going anywhere. Did you find any of the regulations difficult? What I'm recalling is years ago, there was a couple who worked, I think, in Research at Dow, whose dream was to have a country in, a French country in. And um, they saved up their money and they finally found a farmhouse. And then they ran into regulations, disability regulations, bathroom, ramps, this, that. And they told me, the, the cost of complying with the regulations ate up their budget for kitchen supplies and opening supplies, and they weren't able to live their dream. Well, I totally understand that. We had, we ran into a couple of snags on that same level, you know, like, and it's ADA um, regulations, and I'm totally compliant to all that. We should be. I mean, someone that's in a wheelchair doesn't have to, can't eat here because they can't get in. That's silly. Um, for us, obviously, when those things happen, um, you, you, like I said, I mean, obviously I've said adapt a hundred times, but you, you have to. And for us, luckily, um, I'm, I like to be handy and we built a lot of these things. Like for instance, that living wall that you're seeing behind me right now, uh, my wife built that, uh, we got a lot of things that we got our hands dirty and we learned, uh, how to do stuff. And that's part of this. And that helps with your budget. If you're able to, instead of hire someone to come redo all your plumbing, or you know, put a new toilet in or a new sink uh, to make it ADA certified. Um, you know that does cost money because you're paying not only for parts, but you're paying for labor too. But when you learn how to do those things yourself, um, you know, is uh, it's very satisfying and it saves you money. And luckily for me, I uh, this community has. Uh, there's a lot of people that reached out to me and a lot of people that I talked to that uh, I was very happy that we started a relationship and a lot of them helped me out. Um, just volunteers, just, you know, Hey, I want to, uh, I want to help you. And I think we're doing a cool thing here. And 
um, we had a lot of that reach out and I'm pretty excited that I, that was a part of that too. Your ability to uh, accommodate special requests, I think is really wonderful. So whether you're a vegetarian or a vegan or have some other desire, you will work with that, that family or that person. Oh, absolutely. Um, when my, when I first met my wife, she was vegan. Um, and I was like a meat potatoes kind of guy. I was like, how, I was like, what do you eat? Like sauteed vegetables. I don't understand. Um, and she introduced me to a new world of things that I never thought about. Cause I guess I was closed minded of what I was eating myself. Um, so for me, I think it's super important because when we go out to eat, my wife and our son is lactose intolerant. Um, so they can't have dairy and they don't meet, eat any meat. So they eat fish and eggs. So for some reason, it's always when we go out to eat, it's like this thing like, okay, are they gonna get this right? Are they not gonna get this right? Um, and for me, I wanted to create a place that there, you're not gonna have a problem with that. Um, so many dietary restrictions these days and so many different stuff that's been happening um, with people being gluten intolerant, celiac, you know, allergic to eggs, but they can eat chicken. There's all of these. Evan, I have to interrupt because unfortunately we're out of time, but I thank you so much. And for our audience, do something you enjoy, be good at it, <laughs> have enthusiasm, take advantage of opportunity, be kind to someone you know and someone you don't know, and do it again next week when I will see you back here at Junior Dones the Spark. To contact Junia, send her an email at juniadonesthespark at gmail.com. For more information, program schedules, and news about future guests, go to www.juniadonethespark.com. Thank you for joining us. See you next time on Junia Dones the Spark. Local productions seen on Delta College Public Media are made possible with support from viewers like you. Thank you.